Good afternoon and welcome to this panel discussion. I'm George Beebe, Vice President and Director of Studies for the Center for the National Interest. Our topic today, 9-11 and what's changed uh, in the world and, and uh, in the area of counterterrorism uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, this is something that has direct relevance to the safety and security of the American homeland and uh, for America's role in the world. So I'd like to introduce our, our panel and get right into discussion. Each of our speakers is going to begin with some brief opening remarks. Then we're going to go to questions from our audience. And, and those of you uh, in our live audience can submit questions by using the question and answer icon at the bottom of your Zoom screens. We're honored to have with us today uh, Graham Allison, Paul Pillar, and Jessica Stern. All three of them are academicians. Uh, all three of them are highly regarded authors. All three of them have held senior positions in government. Graham Allison of Harvard University served as Assistant Secretary of Defense under President Bill Clinton. Uh, Paul Pillar is a former National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia. And Paul was at the center of the storm, if you will, between intelligence and policy in the aftermath of the attacks on September 11th. Jessica Stern is a research professor at Boston University's Party School of Global Studies. She is one of our nation's top experts on counterterrorism. She served on the National Security Council staff under President Bill Clinton. So let's get started uh, with opening remarks. Uh, Graham, I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, George. Thanks to the Center for National Interest for organizing this. And it's a great uh, pleasure to meet uh, or to be part of a panel with Jessica and Paul, both of whom I know, like, and uh, learn a lot from. Uh, so you, you asked us to start with three big questions. One, the world 20 years on, since we're here at this intersection of 20 years after 9-11 and with the with the aftershocks of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, secondly, terrorism 20 years on uh, in this new world. And third, how about relations with uh, our rivals and friends in trying to uh, preserve American security? These are three big topics and I think you gave us six minutes. So I'm gonna actually punt on the third one for further discussion and talk about the first two, if that's okay. And I think certainly since we're all in a period here this week or the, this month actually, with so much a clamor and such a blizzard of things being said, trying to find some signals of significance in the noise is hard to do. Now, these are all topics that all three of us have thought about and have written about. Uh, uh, so I will try to I'll kind of summarize some things that I've written, and I'll mention uh, with apologies, though one of them is in the uh, National Interest uh, magazine, uh, the pieces, because I think that for people that want more, they can, you know, they can read more. Uh, but the place to start, I believe, for all of us is to uh, confess a level of confusion that uh, I think adults like Paul and Jessica and I and you can do, but that many of your younger viewers may find surprising since we're old enough to have answers rather than, than questions. But I, I'm, I, I read over, and I read again just on holidays, Dean Acheson's President at the Creation. So I urge rereading regularly and briefly, if I quote here, from his summing up, he says, quote, and this is describing the so-called wise men and the period in which they created the strategy that won the Cold War. So this is a success story uh, and one that we all revere. But he says, quote, many times in the course of this book, I have remarked upon our misconceptions of the state of the world around us both in anticipating post-war conditions and in recognizing what they actually were when we came face to face with them. Only slowly did it dawn upon us that the whole world structure and order 
that we had inherited was gone. Okay, so I would say we're present at the recreation. Now, with respect to the first question, uh, the world after uh, 20 years on, uh, I wrote a piece in July in the Center for National Interest on the Geopolitical Olympics uh, that tried to summarize some of my views. And secondly, earlier that year, in the 50th anniversary edition of Foreign Policy, a piece called Grave New World. And just briefly, uh, I think the main thing to appreciate is what Vaclav Havel said. Things have changed so fast, we haven't yet had time to be astonished. So looking at the world 20 years on, yikes, what could possibly have happened? China has not only, is not only a rising power, it's risen to the point that it's upended the post-Cold War order, geopolitically, economically, technologically, militarily, diplomatically. Uh, China needs to be recognized now as a full spectrum peer competitor, not Washington's grudging attempt to see it in the rearview mirror as the quote, near peer competitor. Hmm? So secondly, uh, China's not only overtaken the US in a number of areas, it's actually surpassed us in arenas, which are hard to believe. But uh, we've recently completed a report on the so-called great rivalry between US and China that offers a net assessment of what's actually happened year by year from 2000 to 2020. A little bit of it is previewed in the piece that I, that I referred to. And basically, if you're not shocked, you haven't, uh, uh, from e in each one of the arenas, okay? Uh, and thirdly, if the countries continue on their current trajectory, by 2030, China could have an economy twice our size. So it could have a defense budget or an intelligence budget or otherwise. So I would say that's the big whoa, okay? Now, in Grave New World, I outline 10 points. I'm gonna just mention briefly five of them. So first, the paramount challenge for Americans in 2021, unlike 2020, or so, unlike the year 2000, um, uh, lie at home within the country. The country more divided than at any time since the decade before the Civil War. And what we do or don't do inside the country will have a greater impact on our future than what we do outside the borders. Secondly, the fundamental reason Biden and his successors will have a tougher hand than their predecessors is summarized in three numbers, one half, one quarter, one seventh. End of the World War II, US has half of the world's GDP. End of the Cold War, 1991, we have about a quarter. Today, we have about a seventh. So what a country can do with a seventh of a market share as opposed to half of a market share is significantly different. Third, the conceptual arsenal that was the stuff of the Cold War that you and I and all of us grew up in and lived in and worked within has essentially, is no longer fit for service. And certainly that illusion of a unipolar, a sustainable unipolar era in which as a result of the end of history, uh, market economies and democracies were ensured victory is now been consigned to the dustbin. Uh, fourth, China poses the most perplexing international challenge the US has ever faced, way more difficult than the Soviet Union for many re reasons, details to follow. And finally, fifth, on the 21st century chessboard, the balance of economic power, as Lee Kuan Yew told us, is likely to be at least as important as the balance of military power. So how is the world different in 2020 or 2021 compared to 2001? The answer is hardly recognizable, hardly recognizable. Now, with respect to war and terror and what this means, again, briefly, uh, four points, or three points and a, and a tentative conclusion. So I think it's time for a serious rethinking, serious rethinking of war and terror. 
or war on terrorism or whatever it's called. And I think first identifying the threat, to identify the threat, here we are at the Center for National Interest, we gotta start with national interest. So uh, the mantra that I teach students in my class to repeat in unison from the Cold War is America's vital national interest is to ensure the survival of the US with our fundamental institutions and values intact, period. That their only core vital national interest. So with respect to that, if I try to think about identifying the terrorist threat, it's not terrorism. That was always, Jessica wrote about this originally. It was always a very strange way to label things. Gee, what with the war on terrorism? It's a war on terrorists. It's not on all terrorists. It's a war or campaign against terrorists with the ambitions and the capabilities to attack the US and our key allies. So identifying the threat, that's what I would say, but we need to ask that question again. Secondly, sizing the threat. There's a new emerging consensus that, well, we, we outsize terrorism as a threat. Huh? I'm not sure even about that. Okay. Uh, start. Uh, uh, the number of terrorists is certainly small. Number of terrorist attacks is certainly small. Psychological impact, which is also a part of the picture if you're thinking about American fundamental institutions and values intact. Uh, we are who we are and the psychology of this is huge. So just in the same way that shark attacks have scared the hell out of Americans that are afraid to go in the ocean and COVID panic has people running around thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna die from COVID with no sense of sizing of the relative risk. I think the idea that half of Americans think they personally could be victims of a terrorist attack you know, what, what world are we living in? But in any case, this is the US of America. So the standard line for that is, well, we should harden ourselves or harden our psychology and so forth. Easy to say, but I haven't heard anybody describe how to do it. Okay. Third, America's response. Uh, well, I would start with the bottom line. There's not been another 9-11. And if you would, a 9-12, been prepared to take bets about that, you would have won a lot of money including for me, okay. uh, but it, almost, almost the entire national security community. There were a few people who said overblown, but not very many. Uh, nonetheless, 9-11, basically, we lost our bearings. Uh, and if you go back to the world on the 10th of September, 2001, again, hard to, hard to do, and imagine the Bush administration, Bush was talking about a humble foreign policy. That's what he campaigned on. Uh, Alan Greenspan had told us that our biggest financial problem was that we were gonna pay down our debt. So we're not gonna have any deficit, we're not gonna have a debt, and it's not gonna be any 30 year treasuries. So that'll be the problem for financial markets. Well, we fixed that, okay. So it's a, such a different world. Uh, if there had been no 9-11, Tell me the next two decades of American history. Go back to early 2002, after CIA operatives and the tribal uh, allies had toppled the Taliban from the provincial capitals, have Osama bin Laden on the run. If the US had not sent thousands of troops to fight in Afghanistan, tell me about the history of that world. Hmm? Third, more bigger, bigger, 2003, if the US had never attacked Saddam, toppled Saddam and invaded Iraq through the next 17 years of history. So uh, I think when I look back at the counterfactuals, they're very, very big questions. Uh, but you can hear from the way I pose them by uh, at least where I'm, where I'm headed, just in with the, with the bottom line. Uh, if, if the increased counter-terrorist capabilities of both the US and our friends and allies uh, that we've seen develop can be as successful in suppressing and containing 
global terrorists who have an ambition and capability to attack us, bracket of whom there are very few, in Afghanistan, as well as they have been able to do in Yemen and in Somalia and in Syria and in Iraq and other countries, then I think for the counter-terrorist program going forward, we have a pretty good picture. So I'll stop there. Graham, thank you very much. Um, your, uh, your insights I found quite, quite humbling, so thank you. Paul, the floor is yours. George, thank you. It, it's a pleasure to uh, join my colleagues on this panel for, for this event. You know, there's been a widespread popular tendency in the United States to think that terrorism and counterterrorism all began back in September 2001. And this blizzard of 20-year uh, retrospectives might lead one to believe that. Of course, they didn't really all start back then. And realizing that helps us to think accurately about where we go from here. And terrorism has been around for millennia as a tactic that the weak have always used against the strong and it will continue to be around in that capacity. It cannot be eradicated and there's no particular outcome that I would fairly describe as a win in any war on terrorism that can be achieved in that sense. The, the very concept of a war on terror, and this follows on some of the comments that Graham mentioned, was an unfortunate formulation since terrorism is a tactic, not a set of enemies. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, once remarked that to talk about a war on terror is like describing World War II as a war on blitzkrieg. And this idea of a war on terror, it helped included the, uh, it inculcated the idea that there's going to be a definite end to it, which led to various measures like the detentions at Guantanamo that were justified as extraordinary and temporary, even though they didn't really offer any way of affixing an expiration or sunset date to them. The war metaphor also quite naturally and unsurprisingly emphasized military means, which resulted in an over-militarization of this country's approach to terrorism. The military means have been useful and even necessary when combating groups that, although labeled as terrorist groups, became in effect insurgent movements like Al-Qaeda was 20 years ago, or even more so like ISIS at its heyday around 2014, a mini state. But the military means are generally not as useful as other counterterrorist instruments in getting at the preparation and the other activities that are most relevant to the threat of terrorist attacks against Americans, especially here in the US homeland, where the preparation for such terrorist operations can largely take place, as indeed the 9-11 operation itself did inside Western countries as well as in cyberspace. Now, despite the terminology of a war against a tactic, uh, the fact is it has been, as, as Graham mentioned, uh, appropriately thought of as a combat against certain named groups, known groups, specifically, and for a long time, one would think almost exclusively Al-Qaeda, and then later on when it arose, ISIS. And there has been an awful lot of success against those two groups, both of which, as a group, um, uh, are shadows of what they once were, uh, either 20 years ago or in ISIS's case, you know, six or seven years ago. But that still leaves all the possibilities for individuals and for small groups, twosomes, threesomes, and so on, to continue to operate, in many cases using the same ideologies and even brand names that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have left us with. And so there's still plenty of need in the years ahead for the kind of research that Jessica has done that focuses on motivations and you know, what leads individuals to uh, go over that threshold and get into the very nasty business of terrorism. You have to look at the conditions and the grievances that have fueled such motivations. And unfortunately, I see most of them as continuing. The conditions include poorly functioning economies in many of the countries of origin of the sorts of people we're concerned with, coupled with unresponsive political systems in those same countries. And as far as the grievances are concerned, well, as for the ones that relate most specifically to possible threats against the United States, the things that have come up again and again in propaganda and claim statements 
and in the interrogation of captured terrorists, they're still out there. Things like US military presence on someone else's soil or the nature of the US relationship with Israel and its implications for the plight of the Palestinians or harm from lethal US military action abroad. And in that connection, we might reflect on that recent uh, Hellfire missile strike in Afghanistan, where you know, the US military, I think, had very good reasons to identify it as a, a, a target of including guys who are up to no good, given the secondary explosion of the car that was hit, but which once again, like so many other times over the past 20 years, has raised issues of, of collateral damage and, and civilians getting killed or wounded. Now, speaking of Afghanistan and the US withdrawal, you know, another recent incident we might reflect on was the ISIS suicide bombing outside the Kabul airport that killed 13 of our US service members, the most recent terrorist attack in which American citizens have, have fallen victim. Well, you know, that I think demonstrates that rather than fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them here as the slogan has gone so often over the last 20 years, it's maybe more a matter of them fighting us there because we're over there. And as for the Taliban Al Qaeda relationship, which has gotten a lot of attention uh, over these last couple of weeks, that is going to depend in my judgment overwhelmingly on the extent to which an Afghan civil war does or does not continue. You know, when the Taliban were more or less in charge of most of that place back in 1996 to 2001. They never controlled all of Afghanistan. They were heavily engaged in the civil war against the Northern Alliance, which still uh, uh, controlled uh, you know, perhaps about a quarter of the country. And in that situation, they were grateful for the support in that civil war that they got from Al Qaeda fighters with that group being then in a position to give that kind of support. If a civil war were to continue to rage in Afghanistan, uh, that kind of support might again be welcomed by the Taliban leadership. But to the extent that it doesn't, we have to remember the Taliban is about as insular a group as you're going to find anywhere. They are interested in power in Afghanistan and the political and social order of Afghanistan. They are not interested in international terrorism. And they will have very vividly in their minds the fact that the biggest setback they ever suffered after the fall of 2001 was a direct response to Al Qaeda's 9-11 operation. And of course the US response to it. It is in their interest not to uh, see a repetition of that again. A word about defensive anti-terrorism measures, especially back here at home. We've had made major progress on that. I'm talking about everything from the, you know, the magnetic, uh, detectors and the x-ray machines and the bollards and the guards and everything else. It certainly is much harder for a group to pull off a major attack in the US homeland, a la 9-11, particularly but not exclusively ones involving civil aviation. But that still leaves many other techniques, especially suited to those individual actors and the twosomes and threesomes, that are essentially impossible to defend against everywhere. These include the gun attacks, the knife attacks, and, and a technique that uh, I would be not surprised at all to see more of, uh, mowing down people with a vehicle, the kind of thing we've seen in London and a few years ago, we saw on a smaller scale at Charlottesville. As for Charlottesville, that raises another topic, which is the extent to which the focus on foreign radical Islamists over the last two decades has resulted in a relative inattention to other varieties of terrorism that are most likely to claim Americans as victims and indeed have over the most recent few years, especially the last two or three years, claimed more American victims than any other. I'm talking about domestic terrorism, primarily of the right wing and especially the white supremacist variety. Now this is related to how our attentions have been directed over these last 20 years in that the focus on the foreign radical Islamists uh, has unfortunately also encouraged at many times a broader anti-Islamic -is or Islamophobia 
uh, which is related to a larger xenophobia that underlies much of the kind of domestic extremism that I'm talking about. Domestic, although one with foreign ties to counterparts in Europe and elsewhere. And it's further related to other political developments uh, you know, during these last couple of decades, including the election of the first black US president, followed by another president who incorporated some of these same themes into what passed for a political mainstream. And, and Graham uh, mentioned this or Im implied it when he talked about the main challenges be being here at home. Some of the uh, divisions that have resulted in a nothing short of a breakdown of what uh, we could have assumed not all that long ago uh, was a consensus among Americans about their political and social system. I think if there's any one date that ought to be considered significant as we think about terrorist threats to Americans in the years ahead, that date might not be September 11th, but rather January 6th. A couple of final thoughts back looking at the foreign side in terms of needed policies and practices. One is the all important, all important factor of foreign liaison and foreign cooperation with, with other governments. When I was a government official working on counterterrorism in the 1990s, uh, some of the most uh, important interactions I had with foreign counterparts were with ones in governments that we definitely considered to be adversaries, not allies. Uh, Counter-terrorist cooperation, including on the intelligence side, which is where I was working, um, found a lot of places where there were parallel interests in terms of having concerns about the same sorts of bad guys, uh, even when our governments were divided on just about everything else. And so we have to keep that approach in mind. And sometimes we're going to have to hold our noses with regard to the sorts of regimes we might have to cooperate with in order to take advantage of the assets they have uh, in terms of local knowledge, the ability to conduct raids and arrests and so on that we, we might not have. And a final point concerns the sort of messaging that uh, our leaders need to give to our own public. And this relates to another point that Graham raised, and that's how uh, the psychological and thus the political impact of terrorism far outstrips the actual political impact. Uh, it's, it's not hard for out of government analysts like ourselves to make comparisons between things like how many people have been killed by terrorism and how many people die in bathtub drownings. It is admittedly a lot harder for a national political leader to deal with the psychological factors as they've uh, shown themselves uh, so much over these last 20 years. But I think it is a mark of leadership um, to talk about not bathtub drownings, but other serious lethal challenges from the policy point of view, such as climate change and pandemics. Um, and to put the continued terrorist threat, and it will be continued in the ways that I mentioned, in the proper sort of perspective and assign the proper priorities. Uh, it's not gonna be easy, but uh, that will be one of the responsibilities of our, our leaders in the years to come. George, back to you. Hey, thank you, Paul. Jessica, the floor is yours. So what, what I've been thinking about uh, is closely related to what my colleagues have have just said, I've, I've been thinking a lot about fear and, and what fear has done to us. And in fact, what Graham said about the importance of identifying the threat, is it a war on terrorists? Is it a war on terrorism? Or is it a war on terror? I think that we have been waging a war on our own fear. Uh, it's um, Really, terrorism is a psychological threat more than a military threat or even a, a, a political threat. And I, I think we kind of fell into a trap. The terrorists aim to make us overreact. And I, I, think, I think that might have happened. The intelligence community was warning about a major attack by, by Al Qaeda for years. Um, and I'm sure Paul could tell us more about that. But People really ignored the threat, uh, including in the White House. And I can see this ignoring the threat playing out in my career. When I first started working on terrorism, uh, including with the possibility with, with uh, chem, bio, or nuclear agents, 
uh, it was really considered to be a, a very eccentric uh, area to, of study. And then immediately after 9-11, it became a, quite a fashionable area of study. And I think it, it also was something that, you know, in retrospect, looking back, it seems that we did overreact in, in quite a few ways. And risk analysts can tell us a lot about why that might have happened. Uh, when something shocks us, when dangers are available in the risk analyst sense, that is their vivid, visual, something easy to imagine or recall, such as a tower falling down, such as people jumping to their deaths from that tower, uh, we feel disproportionate dread and we're prone to responding immediately with something called uh, action bias. I will quote one of my advisors, uh, having Graham on this panel is making me uh, think about being a student. Um, and Richard Zeckhauser has this concept uh, of um, the, the action bias that policymakers will take action without thinking about the long-term consequences of the action, without thinking about new risks that might be introduced as a result of the policy remedy, and often choosing those policy remedies for which they're likely to get the most credit. There are 18 variables associated with disproportionate dread, according to you know, one of the great risk analysts, uh, Paul Slovich. We feel disproportionate dread when dangers involve uncertainty, involuntary exposure, and the potential for catastrophe, among many other characteristics. I'd like to propose an additional characteristic that uh, hasn't been tested, but I think it should be, and that is the idea of evil. I think that there, there was something that felt truly evil about 9-11, and President Bush articulated that notion for us. He, he said three days after the attack, he was going to rid the world of evil. He referred to uh, the evildoers many times. And I think, I, you know, we went into Afghanistan. We, we managed to, within about 60 days, take down uh, the Taliban. Uh, obviously, it took quite a bit longer to finally find bin Laden himself. But the terrorists were very quickly dispersed. Uh, and even after bin Laden was killed, we continued this war on evil, this war on uh, the evil ones, the evildoers, this uh, war on our own fear. And I, I think that's where we went wrong. And obviously the same thing applies to Iraq. In both countries, we, although it was clearly anticipable, anticipable, we did not apparently anticipate the emergence of ISIS uh, in, in both countries. Um, so we, we just weren't thinking about the new risk that we might create as a result of these policy remedies. I mean, I, I very strongly oppose the Iraq war. I favored the war in Afghanistan, but I see how we, we fell into a trap and continue to war with it with a mission that was way beyond the original mission, which was to make sure those terrorists did not attack us again. Uh, as Graham says on, on the 12th of September, many people were really, really worried about that. And, and uh, I also wanna endorse what Paul said that this is a risk that will stick with us, whether it's coming from white nationalists, whether it's coming from black nationalists, whether it's coming from echo terrorists. And now we're seeing individuals who combine all these, well, white nationalism and echo terrorism, uh, sort of extreme right and extreme left uh, together. Um, we will continue to see uh, jihadi threats, uh, but I also want to endorse the idea that there are some less dread inducing dangers that experts have been warning us about for, for decades, including emerging infectious disease. And 
uh, including climate change. Those those dangers are have now become visible in the way that terrorism was and perhaps we can pay more attention to them now i'd like to think that we'd be more rational and not need not need a danger to become available in the risk analyst sense in order to pay more attention to it um, I also just want to say a little bit about something that i've been working on lately, which is um, evaluating how probation officers and NGOs are dealing with the, the, in the release of a large number of terrorists. There are about 300 of them, um, people who are um, convicted of terrorism-related crimes who have come out in the last few years. And it's remarkable to see the, how probation officers are, are thinking about this, where, of course, they're we're worried about recidivism. Um, so far, it doesn't look like terrorists recidivate at the same rate that ordinary criminals do, uh, thankfully. Um, I guess one thing I can tell you that I find very interesting about what probation officers say, about what makes them su successful and sometimes less successful, it's when they establish rapport with the violent extremist, the, the offender who is released from prison where they feel they can, they feel most confident uh, of their ability to keep that terrorist out of prison. I will stop there. Thank you, Jessica. You, you all have given us a lot to, to think about and you're provoking some good questions from our audience already. Uh, I'm gonna kick off the question uh, and answer session with a question of my own. Um, you all uh, to one degree or another have suggested that the United States um, may have overreacted uh, in assessment of the size of the threat, the dangers that it poses uh, to fundamental US interests, and in the ways we should deal with, with uh, terrorists in, in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, now, one of the things that we did uh, in those months and years after the attacks was to create um, what in retrospect looks like an enormous bureaucracy. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the uh, Directorate of National Intelligence. Um, we greatly uh, uh, increased the size of our special operations forces. Um, now, one of the things that uh, I think is, is a generally understood bureaucratic uh, law is that when bureaucracies are created, uh, they uh, rarely say, mission accomplished, you don't need us anymore. <laughs> so um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on how, uh, how we might be able to more realistically assess the threat and uh, more uh, proportionately deal with it when we have uh, created such a large cadre of people for whom it is their job to identify and deal with terrorists. Who would like to start? So I have a, as a longtime student of bureaucracy and government, I have empathized with your, with the question. And I think that uh, it certainly is correct that uh, there are not too many departments of the US government that were ever established that were abolished, uh, including, I think, I think one of the great achievements in the Reagan administration, if I remember, was that you know, finally they were able to abolish the tea tasting, whatever unit that had been established in the 18th century or something, yeah, so that he could at least have something to put a put a check by. So it's his his view would have been would have been otherwise. I think that the part of what I find so discouraging about the U.S. response to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, was that at virtually every level of government that had been organized and created to deal with so-called infectious diseases or even infectious diseases, as Jessica mentioned, that might have been brought to us malignly by some adversary, a terrorist or even a foreign government, 
that at virtually every level, the system failed. And that while in every unit of this government, we had uh, offices that were responsible for something. And we had often uh, even exercise, had, had, had war games where we explored a scenario, including uh, the release of a virus that would spread in the US. Uh, one of the so-called uh, crimson contagion that was developed in the Obama administration and played out in the first year of the Trump administration. Uh, I, if I was giving doing a report card, I would give F to virtually every level of performance. And while uh, I gave uh, uh, Dr. Fauci was uh, high marks for standing up to Trump because if the two choices are between what Trump was saying and what Fauci was saying, there was no contest. Okay. Uh, it's the fact is, I remember Fauci from the Reagan administration, God help us. So he's been in that job for more than three decades and it's called the uh, Institute for Infectious Diseases and it plus the HHS plus DHS had been saying they were prepared for bioterrorists or biosecurity events. But when uh, the bell rang, they had no capability for conducting tests to determine who was infected. Okay, let's see what? And I said, well, who, who could have imagined? Okay, the answer is, excuse me, the South Koreans were testing Americans who happened to be serving in South Korea with tests that they had developed and which they were perfectly happy to provide for us if we would use them. But we also had another system called the FDA and the CDC which said, oh, if it's not invented here, we can't have it. So for months, the US had no capacity for testing who, I'm just taking one trivial or relatively trivial component of the picture. So I think, it's probably quite likely that if you were to do a serious assessment of much of what's been developed in the meantime, it's in the style of Washington bureaucratics that are uh, 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 have a lot of show, a lot of PowerPoints, a lot of uh, 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 plans or plans and folders, and very little capability. And I just if I raise one last thing, the contrast I would say with between that and the special forces capabilities for uh, finding and killing people is like night and day. So I remember when special forces was Solik in the defense department and whenever you wanted them to do anything, this is back even in the, in the Clinton administration, they would come with a whole bunch of PowerPoints and the conclusion of each one was we need more money and another year to prepare. Uh, never capable of doing anything that I saw. Uh, but the capability that was built by McRaven and McChrystal and company has developed a whole new magical capability that is very impressive. Now, maybe how many they are and uh, what they do if they don't have any terrorists to be chasing down or otherwise, there's issues there. But it is possible as I think they demonstrate, to build new remarkable capabilities. And I think thanks to those new remarkable capabilities, there's some dead would have been terrorists who might have succeeded in conducting terrorist attacks against the US. Paul. Well, I don't think there's any one simple answer to your question, George. When you look at something like uh, Department of Homeland Security, you know that was in large part a consolidation of what had been separate agencies that had been scattered elsewhere on the uh, federal organization chart. And I happen to think it makes sense, for example, for the immigration people and the customs people that you deal with when you come into the airport to be all in the same department rather than split into two different departments like they used to be. It is true that you know when the bureaucracies get established, they don't have a tendency to be disestablished. With regard to the you know what happened with the intelligence community and the creation of the Office of Director of National Intelligence, I've written quite a bit about this and have opined that I didn't think that was a you know a net advantage, uh, but I've also said that now that we've got it, let's just try to make it work as well as we can and not have the disruption of yet another reorganization. Let's wait until the next big quote intelligence failure unquote where there'll be a demand for moving boxes around again, and then we can try to fix some of the shortcomings. 
Um, but I, I think in the meantime, you know, it is within the power of, of any administration and an office of management budget and of course Congress to you know, reallocate resources, both human and financial to, to up the importance or, or lower the, the priority rather, or lower the priority of what's being devoted to, to any particular program. You know, the, the organization chart is a, is a shell and you can fill it or drain it however much you want. We have a question from uh, Paul Hare, who is a distinguished fellow at the Center for the National Interest. Um, he asks, will the circumstances of our withdrawal from Afghanistan generate a renewal of a Central Asia-based terrorist threat to the United States? I think this is a question that a lot of Americans have right now. Who would like to try this? I'll try, and I'm sure the others will add on. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, I, I think in in my you know I, I, I in the narrow field of what some people call terrorism studies, I, I I was concerned that there was too much focus on domestic terrorism actually because it was available after January six, uh, and um, I, I think this is yes. Uh, I think what what has just happened in Afghanistan does pose a long term. Uh, danger. I don't. It's not immediate, and I, it does seem very likely Central Asia will will be involved. I'm very curious what Paul would say to this. Well, I, I, with regard to you know the U.S. military withdrawal, I, I I would be less pessimistic. I don't see how the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan was was doing a whole lot to uh, you know, prevent uh, you know, the emergence of terrorist havens in the stands farther to the north. How about the takeover of, of, of the Taliban so quickly though? Um, even if uh, you just argued earlier that the presence of US troops is, is attractive to terrorists, but with the Taliban's victory, um, you know, what's your answer to the question in light of that? Uh, the, the Taliban does not have an interest in, you know, stoking instability or terrorist havens or revolutions or anything else in the sands to the north. They, you know, to the extent that they do have a continued civil war, that will be their, in, inside Afghanistan, that will be their top priority, to wage it and to win it. To the extent that they do win that, then their priorities are going to become ones that you hear a lot of talk about in terms of, uh, you know, external recognition. Um, a lot is going to depend on the other regional powers, certainly China, certainly Pakistan, also Iran and India have a role in terms of how this whole so-called new great game involving the stands in Central Asia is going to play out. You've got plenty of concerns. I mean, take China with all their concerns about uh, the Uyghurs and uh, other forms of uh, other you know, Islamic groups uh, and the potential for trouble in, in their Western provinces. Um, you know, their priority vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban will place a lot of, will have a lot to do with making sure that trouble doesn't brew in the stands to the north. And to the extent that the Taliban does or does not make a difference, you know, with regard to cross-border movement and so on, the strong Chinese motivation is going to be to, in the same direction that we would want it, uh, to, you know, to not do anything that would contribute to uh, you know, the, the sort of thing that, we're, that uh, the questioner worries about uh, with regard to terrorist havens in the stand. So, so I, I really don't see it as a greater problem because of the U.S. withdrawal. There are a lot of variables here, but they, all, they don't depend on the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. So, so Paul, let me follow up with a, with a question because I've been, again, trying to quote, rethink the war on terrorism. So if so if we ask about the conditions that generate or, or that uh, make it more likely that terrorists and even terrorists that have global aspirations may emerge, you mentioned, uh, if I remember in your earlier comments, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the poverty and uh, uh, the absence of development and, and sorry, I don't have my uh, and their grievances about the United States. Their grievances and so forth. But if I were being, uh, again, uh, my contrarian and helpful self, I, I, I would say a good uh, uh, 
authoritarian govern ruthless authoritarian government may be very effective in suppressing and containing such people. Uh, uh, don't want them on their soil because they might be problem for them. Don't want them on their soil because if they are doing something, we might come and strike them. Uh, or what it is is our relationship. And so I think if I've watched, uh, there was actually more than a little alignment between US Special Forces and the Taliban in the campaign against ISIL K here recently. And one of somebody I know says, we became their Air Force. <laughs> you know? uh, so they think, wait a minute. And then if I look at uh, Syria, for all the travesty of Syria, uh, Assad and uh, the Russians have been pretty ruthless, but successful in getting after terrorists whom at least they think may have some aspirations to do something to them. So I, I think part of, part of my problem is, yes, okay, if it was only terrorism, uh, maybe that's, I like that, but, uh, one of the problems about Americans is we believe in both peace and freedom. So uh, uh, how, how have you wrestled with that? Or, and Jessica, both of you thought a lot about this. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And that, it, that gets back to my comment about how we, we would have to hold, insofar as we want to get cooperation on counterterrorism, we are going to have to hold our nose as, with regard to some of the people and regimes we're going to cooperate with. You mentioned that you know, we have this conflict between the Afghan Taliban and ISIS-K. Um, now, uh, you know, and, and to the extent that we're concerned about ISIS-K, you know, the biggest thing we have going for us is the Taliban. Uh, I'm not about to predict, you know, the creation of some formal liaison relationship with the Taliban anytime soon, especially when you got one of the Haqqanis as the interior minister. <laughs> but um, this is among the many trade-offs that we deal with all the time with regard to uh, characteristics of a regime that we like or don't like and other priorities such as counterterrorism. Jessica, any thoughts on that question? Okay, I, I'm, I, I really don't know the answer to the question, but I, I will offer that I think I'm the only one here who is at Haqqaniya, which is the school that created the Taliban. And I will tell you that at that school that created the Taliban, um, which, which was run by Molana Sandwich, um, he was called that because of his sexual proclivities. Um, there were so-called Russians who were from the stands and from Chechnya. I, I don't know the answer to the question, but I do think it's worth noting that there was a kind of a surprising collaboration um, among uh, various kinds of jihadis. By the way, uh, even collaboration with Iran, at least that's what they told me, which is not, that's not jihadis, but um, that, that's all I can add there. <laughs> yeah, we have a question from Chip Gregson, uh, also from the Center for the National Interest, who asks, is Pakistan better off or worse off as a result of our withdrawal from Afghanistan? I think the oh, answer is, ye is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I, I, I think the Afghanistan piece of this is one of the most interesting ones. So Chippers is, is usual right on target to try to understand. So on the one hand, uh, the Fatah and Pakistan uh, were the sanctuary for the Taliban leadership and Al Qaeda, and had a, a, a basically a nearly inviolate sanctuary, because with large ground forces fighting in Afghanistan, the U.S. required the transit routes through Pakistan in order to fight the war on terrorism, so-called, okay? which really was a war on Taliban. Uh, for the recent period. So you think, wait a minute, okay. So now if I no longer have ground forces in Afghanistan, then I can hit a target in Pakistan as easily as I can hit a target in Afghanistan. So for Mr. Haqqani running across the border 
into Pakistan and saying, oh, we're off limits, uh, no more, maybe, maybe. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, a lot of these folks who had some other agenda, uh, I mean, the Haqqanis in particular are fascinating, and Paul has studied them for a long time. Basically, uh, they and their Pashtun friends live on both sides of a, what they regard as an arbitrary border. So I don't know where the Pashtunistan here maybe has a, has a future. Uh, so the Pakistan will have to worry about that. So I don't know. The, uh, I think it's a great question. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, pose to all of you uh, a variation of what uh, Graham started off speaking about. And uh, I want to recall the, uh, the famous observation from uh, Otto von Bismarck, who said that the statesman's challenge is to, to listen for the footsteps of God and try to catch on to his coattails. So, uh, Graham, you had said uh, that uh, recognizing the uh, events that are underway and understanding their, their significance is an extremely challenging task. Can you all try to uh, speculate a little bit about uh, the events that are going on right now in the world, where they might be leading, and how the United States might try to catch the coattails as, this, uh, as these footsteps proceed? Uh, Graham, since you raised this question, I'm not gonna start with you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to start with Paul, if you don't mind. Um, I think uh, cooperation among otherwise perhaps adversarial powers on the great transnational challenges of our time, which we've mentioned a couple in this session, climate change, I would put right at the top of the list and certainly as the pandemic has reminded us of uh, uh, transmissible diseases. I, I think, you know, if, if we're having a session 10 or 20 years from now, and we look back at how we collectively as either intelligentsia or the policy community handled things, this will be looked at as the most important thing that was either handled well or handled poorly. Um, so I, I think uh, like on climate change, all of our reminders of that, you know, the hurricanes and the wildfires and so on needs to feed directly into um, policy toward China and how we fit that into our whole agenda, particularly with that power, but, but also with other powers. I would place that above everything else in terms of the significance of what we're seeing right now. Jessica? I think that was a very good answer. And I think I will answer by endorsing Paul's answer. <laughs> very good. And Grandma, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Well, I think maybe I had my say before. I, I like very much Paul's formulation. And so I would start by agreeing with Jessica and be the, the third, the, the third. I think uh, the piece that I would emphasize more though, uh, or equally, uh, is that in China, I think the US has a geopolitical rival uh, of proportions greater and graver and more complicated than any that the US has ever encountered. Uh, that this is, as I've written, uh, a great Thucydidean rivalry in which it's not just a competition between great powers, it's a special form of that, a competition between a ruling power who believes that its rule is essential for the order and well being of itself and the world, and which is actually for all of the, all that we didn't do in the war on terrorism, perhaps, has had a pretty remarkable run in the period since World War II in providing now more than seven decades without great power war and a period in which there's been more increase in human well-being than ever before. So you have on the one hand, uh, the America we know and love that is accustomed to being at the top of every pecking order. And on the other hand, a rising power, a meteoric rising power whose rise is actually shifting the seesaw, the balance of power, 
the fundamental tectonics of power globally in every dimension. And that story is a story we've seen often in history, uh, often didn't turn out well, though not always, not always. So I would say that will be a, a feature. And then while Paul, Paul's point I think is so relevant is that at the, if, it were, if it were simply a Thucydidean rivalry, at least that one I can almost get my head around. It's in the special conditions of the 21st century in which we recognize we live on a small globe in which we have transnational challenges like climate in which neither party can be successful without the cooperation of the other. So how in the world can we be the fiercest rivals on the one hand, but somehow cooperating and collaborating on the other? That sounds like a contradiction. I think in some sense it is, but Scott Fitzgerald said that the test of a first class mind is to be able to hold two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time and still function. So I would say that's my version. Well, thank you. And uh, we certainly have had some first class minds participating in this panel today. So thank you all. I'm going to draw the discussion to a to close. Uh, thanks to our, our audience for questions. Thank you, panelists. And uh, I will look forward to our next event at the Center for the National Interest. Thank you.